Hi, I'm Chris Sangster, and welcome back to the studio. Today I want to show you how I record vocals in Logic Pro. Specifically, I want to show you my workflow for recording myself singing. I know a lot of us out there are one-person shops, and we have to simultaneously be the artist and the engineer. And this can be tricky, but with a little planning and some tricks I've learned over my decade plus as a recording engineer, we can make this process as smooth as possible. So a lot of the work of capturing a good recording happens before you press the record button. In fact, I think the most important decisions you will make when recording happen before the tape rolls. The first factor to consider is the acoustics of your recording space. Obviously, we don't all have the luxury of a dedicated vocal booth to record our vocals in. But honestly, this is not necessary to capture a great vocal sound. We just have to be intentional about how we set up our space and how we position our microphone. Every space is different, but let's use my room as an example to show some best practices. Now, I do have a well-treated room but it's set up in a way that forces me to give some extra consideration to recording vocals. I just have the one room to my studio and I need it to be versatile with a nice controlled sound for mixing and mastering, but still retaining some roomy characteristics for recording. Because of this, I have gone for a live end dead end setup where I have a lot of acoustic treatment and control with these corner bass traps, the clouds on the ceiling and the carpet at my mixing position but then a bit more of a lively sound in the back of the room with the bare wood floor and the wooden diffuser panel. This sounds great for recording, especially guitar and percussion, but it requires a bit more deadening when it comes time to record vocals. And because of this, I use a reflection filter. I've had this one from SE Electronics for years and it works great. And you can see it's a bit janky to set up after years of use, but it still gets the job done well by closing off the space to the sides and back of the microphone. If you're in a livelier room or an untreated space, I highly recommend picking up something like this. It allows you to get that dry, intimate vocal booth sound even in livelier rooms. Now, it won't turn a church hall into a vocal booth, but if you're in a bedroom, it can really do wonders. The main thing you want to be aware of when thinking about acoustic treatment with regards to recording vocals are parallel hard surfaces. So think floor and ceiling, the parallel walls of your room. If these surfaces are untreated, it can cause serious issues in your vocal recording. Our goal is to record as dry of a signal as possible so we can add reverb and delay to it when mixing. And these parallel hard surfaces will create unwanted reflections that lead to a splashy or even worse, a comb filtered sound. If you don't have proper acoustic treatment or even a reflection filter, it's okay. You can still use what you have around the house to deaden your room. Blankets and carpets are your friend. Start by putting a carpet under your microphone position and then try hanging a heavy blanket or a duvet on the wall behind you. This is a good starting point and then you can add more heavy blankets to other walls in your room or more layers of carpet under your feet as you see fit. Also, think about where in your room you will position your microphone. If you're in an untreated room, putting the mic right in the middle of two walls might not be the best choice. Consider positioning your mic at an angle to parallel surfaces or put your mic where you're able to hang the most absorption materials. The important thing is to try out different placements. Don't just go for one because it looks right. Go to different spots around your room, do a short test recording, and then compare the results. For my room, I know this spot here about a third of the way back in between my two wall panels is my sweet spot. And I always use this same spot for recording vocals. The next important consideration is microphone choice. Now, this is a deep, deep topic that is probably beyond the scope of this video, but it is vitally important that you match the right microphone with your voice if you want to achieve the best results. Unfortunately, all the online research in the world will only get you so far. You really have to try out different microphones to know what's going to work best for your voice. This is an unfortunate reality because microphones are expensive, but it is the truth. However, the best advice I can give you is use what you've got. Don't spend your money to try and get a better sound. Instead, experiment with setup, acoustic treatment, vocal technique, and your song arrangement to improve your sound. 
these will all pay more dividends in the long run than buying a new microphone will. And if you're in the fortunate position of having several different microphones at your disposal, do a test recording on each one to see which one sounds best on your voice. For me, I have tried many microphones on my voice, cheap ones, expensive ones, everything in between, but I always come back to Old Faithful, the Shure SM7B. It's a time-tested mic, it's not insanely expensive, and it honestly works great on a lot of voices, particularly baritones like myself. One tip though, if you're using an SM7B, is to set the EQ on the back with the high boost engaged. I find this gives a better sound for vocals with enough top end detail to stand out in a full pop or rock mix. Now that we have our microphone selected and in the right place in the room, we can get the rest of our self-recording setup in order. For this, it's best if you have an iPad that you can run Logic Remote on. This way you will be able to control Logic Pro from your recording position and you don't have to go back and forth to the computer as much. I like to set up two music stands around my microphone. One to my right to place my lyrics on and one set lower down to my left for the iPad. And because I have these metal music stands, I like to tape a hand towel over them before recording to reduce any reflections that might come off of them and to prevent them from sympathetically resonating with my voice and causing noise. So once we have those set up, we're going to set up Logic Remote. Just open the app on the iPad, select your Mac that is running Logic, and then accept this dialog box on your Mac and you're good to go. Full control of Logic on your iPad. I also like to set this little stool behind me to use as like a table to set water or tea on. You wanna make the environment of your recording position as functional and as comfortable as possible without compromising on sound. It's important to strike this balance. Now, my interface of choice is a big part of my vocal recording setup. If you're a UAD user, you can follow along with my setup process here, but if you use another interface, your mileage may vary with this part of the video. The number one reason I use a UAD Apollo is the zero latency monitoring. Once you go zero latency, you will never go back to input monitoring in Logic. It is such a game changer. And to take advantage of the zero latency capabilities of the Apollo, we must monitor our recording signal through the UAD console and not through Logic. To do this most effectively, I set up a nice sounding vocal chain in the UAD console. I'm gonna set my microphone channel up here on analog one, and then I'll use three plugins and one send to achieve my channel strip sound. First is the precision channel strip, in which I'm doing some EQ. Some cuts to the lows and mids to take out some of that boom from the SM7B and some unpleasing boxy frequencies of my voice, and then adding a bit of top end to help my voice cut through the mix. After that, I go into an 1176 for some standard leveling compression. And then finally, I use the precision limiter. This allows me to bring the level of my vocal up as loud as I want in my headphones without causing clipping. Then on aux send one, I have a hall reverb, which is just a preset in the UAD Realverb Pro that I like the sound of. And I follow it with the Mog EQ just to bring down the top end a bit to give the reverb the slightly darker tone that I prefer. I find too much high end in the reverb to be distracting when recording. And most importantly, I'm going to set the insert effects to UAD Mon, UAD Monitor. This means I will hear the effects of these plugins in my headphones, but they will not be printed onto the sound in Logic Pro. That way we get a dry signal in Logic and we can add a different vocal channel strip there as we see fit. Now let's jump over to Logic and get things set up properly there. To start with, I always make a new project alternative when going to record vocals. I wanna have the flexibility to change things around or bounce tracks down if I need to without losing anything from my production session. In this session, I have my scratch vocals here at the bottom. These are the guide vocals I recorded when writing the song and I will use them as a reference for recording the final takes. Now we need to set up some tracks in Logic to record our final vocals onto. I like to pre-make all of the tracks I think I'm going to need to record vocals on first, so I'm not spending time making tracks when recording. As a good rule of thumb, I like to make two main lead tracks, four background vocal tracks, and four harmony vocal tracks. 
but you may want to tailor these to your specific style and song. So for our vocal chain in Logic, we could replicate the vocal chain from the UAD console exactly, so we will hear the same sound on playback as we do during recording, or we can choose to create a more song specific vocal chain inside of Logic. When recording myself, I typically go with the latter option because I know to expect my voice to sound a bit different on playback. But if you're recording an artist, I find it best to have them hear their voice in playback the same way they hear it in recording. I have a saved channel strip in Logic that I always like to use for recording my vocals. It's pretty close to the UAD console channel strip with the Precision EQ, the 1176, but it also has a de-esser and some distortion and reverb from the Sound Toys effect rack. And a quick note about auto-tune. Although I do have it in my default channel strip, I always turn it off when recording the final vocals. I find it helpful when writing because I don't have to worry about my pitch as much. But when recording final vocals, I wanna really lock in on getting the pitches right. To do this, I need to hear on playback how accurate my pitch is, and obviously I won't hear that if auto-tune is on. Next, I'm going to make sure that my metronome and count-in settings are set up properly. For this song, I want to hear an eighth note click. So I will click and hold on the metronome button in the control bar and go to metronome settings. In this menu, I will turn on division so I can hear that subdivided eighth note click. Then in the LCD, I'll make sure that slash eight is selected below the four four meter. After this, I will again click and hold on the metronome icon and make sure that only click while recording is enabled. Then I like to set up a two bar count in. So I'll click and hold on the count in button next to the metronome and select two bars. And if you don't see any of these buttons in your layout in Logic Pro, just right click in the control bar, go to customize control bar and display, and from there you can enable everything that you need. And an extra step for maximum flexibility with the click track is to go to the mixer and click on the all menu here at the top. This allows you to see the click track as a channel strip in your mixer. I then like to make it a bright color so it's easy to see and I can use the fader or a gain plugin on it to quickly raise the volume of the click track in my headphones. I always like to turn on low latency recording mode when recording vocals, especially if you're recording right into a production session that already has a lot of plugins in it. This way you just take out any chance of recording latency being introduced into the equation. The worst thing is to do a great take only to play it back and hear that it's delayed. That's awful. Our last step in Logic Pro is to create a cycle for where we will be recording first. And I typically like to record vocals by song section. And I'll start with the part where I sing lower to allow my voice to loosen up a bit before tackling the high notes. So in this song, I'm gonna start with the first verse. So I'll select the entire first verse and one bar into the chorus with the cycle. I set it up this way so I don't have to move the playhead in the Logic Remote to record a new pass. It will just start over again with the count in and then the beginning of the cycle every time I hit record. I give that extra bar of leeway at the end of the section just so I have enough time to hit stop before the cycle repeats itself. And a quick reminder if you're using a UAD interface, we do not want to monitor through Logic. To get the zero latency monitoring, we have to monitor through the UAD console. So that means do not input monitor your tracks in Logic. And as a safeguard, I just go ahead and turn off audio input monitoring and software monitoring in the control bar. Before we continue on with the video, I've got a free gift just for you. A topic that causes a lot of confusion in Logic Pro are buses. So I've created the definitive guide to buses in Logic Pro. In this comprehensive video guide, you'll learn what buses are, how to use them, and advanced busing techniques. We start with the very basics and go all the way through some pretty advanced stuff. And I truly believe there is something in this video for everyone. So hit the link in the description box below the like button and download your free copy today. Next, we need to get our headphones set up. If your recording position is a little far away from your gear like mine, you'll probably need a headphone extender cable. It's just a male quarter inch TRS on one end and a female on the other end. Word of caution though, these things break incredibly easy. I cannot tell you how many I've gone through over the years. So it's always best to have a few spares on hand. 
because every time they'll break in the middle of a session and it's the worst. It's of course possible to set up an entirely different headphone mix than what your mix is currently like in Logic, but when recording myself, I find this unnecessary. I simply use the knob on my monitor controller to raise or lower the level of the track, and then the fader on the UAD console to raise or lower the level of my voice in the headphones. So make sure your speakers are not on, unmute your vocal channel on the UAD console and hit play on Logic to test your levels. Make any adjustments as necessary. And you'll see that even with an excellent headphone sound from the UAD console, I still prefer the one ear on, one ear off method when recording vocals. I honestly think most singers prefer this. It's just more comfortable to hear yourself sing acoustically. And for me, it really helps with my pitch control. One note here, you'll see that on the UAD console channel, I'm actually using Phantom Power, even though the SM7B is a dynamic microphone. And this is because I'm using a cloud lifter to boost the signal of the microphone before before it hits the preamp of the Apollo. I absolutely love this thing, and I really think it's a must-have if you regularly record with dynamic microphones. The low natural level of these types of mics means that noise can easily be introduced into the signal if you try to raise the gain with a mic preamp alone. The cloud lifter gives you 25 dBs of clean gain, so I can set my UAD preamp level very conservatively to achieve a super clean signal. About negative 18 dBs is a good starting point for me on the console channel gain. The final thing to discuss before we hit record is a pop filter. Generally, when recording vocals, we want to use a pop filter to reduce the plosive noise caused by air hitting the microphone capsule from your consonant sounds. With any condenser mic, you definitely want to use a pop filter. But with the SM7B, you actually have a choice. You can use the built-in windscreen or you can use a pop filter. If you choose to use a pop filter, I would recommend taking off the windscreen and you do that by getting your fingernail into this little gap here and just pulling up. Using the built-in windscreen honestly sounds fine, but I prefer to use a pop filter for one main reason. It allows me to maintain a consistent distance from the microphone at all times while recording. And this brings up another important topic, microphone technique. Microphone technique is how you as a singer position yourself in relation to the microphone to achieve an optimal sounding recording. It is a skill and you have to practice it. The best advice when you're just starting out is to be about the width of a fist away from the microphone and just maintain that position. Having the pop filter placed at exactly this distance can help you have a physical guide to make sure you're in the right place. If you sing right up on the pop filter, you know you will be at the right distance from the mic. Since the capsule of the SM7B is actually recessed a bit inside of that grill, I'm going to place my pop filter a bit closer to the front of the microphone to approximate this fist distance thereabouts. You also want to place the pop filter so that the microphone capsule is right in the center of it. This again gives you a physical guide to make sure you are singing in the right spot. Sing right up on the pop filter, right through the middle of it, and you're good to go. Now, you can take microphone technique one step further by manipulating your position relative to the mic to achieve certain effects. An example would be pulling your head away from the microphone when singing a loud note in order to maintain a more consistent level in the recording. You could also choose to get very close to the mic on quieter parts for a more intimate, in-your-ear type sound. I also like to take a full step back away from the microphone when recording certain background vocal parts to give them a naturally more distant sound in the mix. The ability to make these decisions in the moment and pull them off correctly takes years of experience and it's what sets the best studio vocalists apart from the pack. If you are not comfortable enough to try these techniques yet, I would suggest just setting your pop filter so that you can sing right into the middle of it and not waver from that spot. This will ensure you get a consistent tone throughout the performance. Are we finally ready to record now? Not quite. Two more things I would be remiss if I didn't mention. The first is something you should do in the days leading up to your vocal recording session, and that is practice. Being well practiced, knowing your part well, knowing how it feels in your voice and in your vocal technique is paramount to getting a good recording. Do not skip this step if you want the best results. And the next is to warm up properly before recording. 
You don't want to go into the vocal booth cold. You'll just be wasting your time on the first several takes getting your voice warmed up. I like to spend about 10 minutes before recording warming my voice up. This way I'm not vocally fatigued at all, but I'm ready to perform at my best the moment I hit record. Okay, we are finally ready to record. See, I told you all the hard work came before we hit the record button. Now we get to have fun. We have everything set up so that we have as little of the technical stuff to deal with as possible and we can just perform. And that's my biggest tip for recording vocals. Perform them. Don't just stand lifeless behind the microphone half-heartedly singing the song. That lack of emotion will come through in the recording. Instead, perform the song like you are performing for an audience. Feel the lyrics, feel the emotion of the song and bring that out in your performance. Just because you want to keep your mouth in one spot doesn't mean the rest of your body can't move. And heck, it's just you in the room anyway. Act a fool, let it all out, pour your emotion out into that microphone. That's what it's all about, and that more than anything will connect you with your listeners. So let's see how I do a pass of the first verse. I'm going to hit record on Logic Remote, and since we already have the count in and the cycle set up, everything starts where it should, and I can focus only on my performance. Whiskey bottle, I know you're dead. Last night's lies still on the bread. Born in rain, cries with the crew. Through this fall, I can't find the truth. My mind is hurricanes and lightning. I swear the storm never left. Now, how many takes should you do? The answer to this question varies wildly from singer to singer. Some people can knock it out in one or two takes. Other people like to do upwards of 70 takes to make a perfect comp. It really depends on what works best for you. And your level of vocal stamina certainly plays into this. If your voice is tired by take 10, then take 50 is not going to be your best take. You really have to learn how your voice works and at what point you reach the point of diminishing returns. For me, I typically like to do between four and eight takes per section with no more than 12 takes on the extreme end. If I can't get a good sounding comp out of 12 takes, then it's just not happening for me that day. At that point, it's best if I just let my voice rest and return fresh the next day. Also, I find doing more than 12 takes just makes the comping process overwhelming. You'll see in these clips that I'm talking to myself a lot in between takes. Dude, that time you want to say it's shorter. Little flat. One more. But I, I'm messing up one line. It's no butt through the den, just through the den. I need to not glottal stop it. Nah, no, is that right? Good tone, bad, bad rhythm. There we go. I gotta make sure I'm doing that thunder line right though. Cool, that one felt good. One more. And that's because I'm producing myself. These are the types of things I would say to an artist in between takes as a vocal producer. So to keep myself on track and performing my best, I find it helps to verbalize these ideas and technique tips to myself. To finish off, let's talk a little bit about how I've structured the vocal arrangement of this song. Every song is a bit different in this regard, but I do have some common tricks I come back to again and again. For this song, I knew I wanted to have a more intimate sounding verse and then a big sound in the chorus with some bluegrass style harmonies. I did end up double tracking the lead in the verses, although I may not need it in the end, but it's better to record more than you need all at once instead of having to go back later and record something you forgot or didn't realize you needed. For the chorus, I did a classic big vocal sound technique. Three tracks of the lead line, one panned up the middle and the other two panned hard left and right, then two tracks of each harmony line for a total of four harmony tracks. I feel the thunder rolling in. You say the silver lines at the end. Maybe there's hope around the bend. But I'm so broken, there's nothing left to mend. It's also important to leave time and room in your vocal session to experiment. 
Some of my best ideas just come spontaneously while recording. Always leave time to be creative. That's what we're here for. And there we go. I've laid down all the tracks I need for this tune and now it's time to comp them. But you'll have to wait until my next video to see my method for that. Thanks so much for checking out this video. I hope it gave you some useful insights into how to get the best out of your next vocal recording session. If you have any questions, please drop them in the comments below. I would be happy to answer them. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and I'll see you at the studio next time. Thanks.